going to talk about three things. So uh, at the end of today, all of you will go away understanding what AI is and what AI isn't. There's lots of confusion about this topic in the media and in the industry, but you will all know what it is and what it's capable of doing. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about is um, how we can bring technology and people together to do amazing things. And the third thing we're going to talk about is what the world might look like in the next 30 years, and it could start to get a bit controversial. So I, so I actually do three things. There we go. Um, I, uh, for fun, I run a master's program in a university called uh, UC UCL in London, which is actually a university ranked in the top seven universities in the world, and nobody's ever heard of it. Uh, and it's probably ranked number one in the, U uh, in the world for artificial intelligence. It's the same university that Google DeepMind spun out of, and a very, very strong pedigree in AI. And my entire academic background is in artificial intelligence and innovation, uh, how we can take these technologies and make them have an impact. And so so I have 50 students every year, 50 uh, master students that work in industry applying these technologies to solving their, their problems. So I've got a really good sense of what's going on in industry. Um, I wear an evil corporate hat where I run a company called Satalia, uh, which has about 80 people, uh, and we build AI solutions for uh, companies across the world. All right, artificial intelligence. So before we get into the definitions of AI, I'm going to take you through this, uh, this technology stack. Okay? And the first question I want to ask you all is, uh, what is data? Figures, yeah, good. It comes from the Latin word datum, which means given things. It's stuff. It's the fabric of our universe. It's ones and zeros. It's symbols. It's bits and bytes. So if I say to you, uh, 210280, what is this? It's data. It's not until you give it uh, context uh, does it become information? So it might be a date of birth, it might be a sort code, it might be how much money I have in my account. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have in computer science is taking this messy world of stuff, this light, this sound, this text, and trying to figure out what does it actually mean. So let me ask you this question. Hopefully you can do this one. What does this probably say? A, B, C? Yes? And what does this probably say? 12, 13, 14, we can see that the light, the data that's entering your eyes is the same light, but you're giving it a different meaning based on its context. Um, okay, what does, uh, let's get rid of the word big data. So big data was a, a, a buzz a few years ago, but if you look at Wikipedia, which is of course the source of all truth, Wikipedia defines big data as more data than you can process on a single machine. It often gets synonymized and confused with these other words, but it's just more data than you can process on a single machine. So if I asked you to process all of the Twitter data on your laptop, you won't be able to. There's too much data to process on that single machine. So you have to distribute it to a cloud, process it, and get back the results. But if I asked you to also open up a, a, a Hubble telescope image, a, a, an image that's 100 gigabytes in size, what will happen when you try to open that on your laptop? Huh? It, won't, it won't open. The memory isn't, isn't big enough. So uh, you have to take that 100 gigabytes, you have to break it into pieces, send it to a cloud, process it, and get back the results. So big data doesn't just mean lots of data. It can also mean big chunks of data. OK, next. I want you to, um, I want you to, uh, to read this. What does this. What does this say, this sentence? What does that sentence say? Not a trick question. Huh? Could be John, read the letter to Mary. So you're telling John, read the letter to Mary. It could be John, read the letter to Mary. John, read the letter to Mary. I want you to picture in your mind the scene. Uh, John, read the letter to Mary. What, what picture do you have in your head? John, read the letter to Mary. Come on. Come on, you can do this. John, read the letter to Mary. Huh? It's in the past. John is reading a letter out loud to Mary. So Mary is there. John is reading. Who's, who has that picture in their head? John reading a letter out loud to Mary. Okay, cool. And does anybody have the picture, uh, John reading a letter that was sent to Mary? John read the letter to Mary. John read, no? Anybody? Sometimes, so, okay, that's another interpretation. But it, it could be that uh, they're learning the alphabet. And I say, John read the letter A, B, C, D to Mary. Or there might be a book called The Letter to Mary. And I say, John read the letter to Mary. Uh, the book might be called The Letter, and I say John read the letter to Mary. They could be four words on a piece of paper, the letter to Mary, and I said John read the letter to Mary. 
This actually can be interpreted in over 13 different ways. And we will all go away with a picture in our mind of what we think is correct, but we're probably wrong. And, uh, and one of the things I'm going to try and convince you all during this talk is that humans are rubbish. Okay, we're, <laughs> we're not very smart. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've come across this concept called the semantic web, and I don't often talk about this in my talks, but I think it's a really interesting new paradigm. Um, the internet, web, web 1.0, uh, was an internet, a, a place where you would get some space on a server and you would put information on that server. So maybe I'll have a web page and on the web page I will say, you know, Daniel works for UCL, he lectures uh, at university, he um, is a founder of Satalia, he likes cats, he lives in London, UCL is a university. So I might, I might write lots of information about me on that website. And then what would happen is that Google or another search engine would pick out the keywords. And so if you touched, uh, uh, searched in Google uh, for Daniels and UCLs, then hopefully my web page will appear in Google. And Web 2.0 is slightly different. Web 2.0 was a single place where you would put content and a single place where you would consume that content. So uh, YouTube and Facebook, this is a uh, web 2.0. Web 3.0 is completely different and it's called the semantic web. Uh, at, the at the moment, machines don't really understand data. And what's happening in the background at the moment on the internet is um, we are actually tagging data. We're tagging data to give it meaning. We're tagging it in a way that uh, is called um, uh, triples. So Daniel works for UCL. UCL is a university. Daniel likes cats. Daniel founded Satalia. Okay, and so these are triples, some, some relationship between two things. And once you start to tag data in this way, you can start to generate what is called a knowledge graph. And uh, so if I typed into Google right now, uh, give me all of the lecturers at London universities that like cats. All right, what Google can't really answer that question. It will try to do some uh, matching of words, but actually what the semantic web will allow us to do is bring back a list of people, like a query, that actually answers that question. So that I will be uh, on that list. And in the future, when we're using our, our augmented reality goggles or virtual reality goggles, I can look out on a crowd and I can say, show me all of the engineers that are paid more than 50,000 euros. And yeah. yeah. I can highlight people like this. So this future world means that we'll be able to query, um, query the, the physical world around us. And we'll be able to ask queries like we've never been able to ask before. So what's happening is that organizations are going through the journey of what is called digital transformation. And we'll talk more about this later on, where they're, they're tagging the data in this way to create these knowledge graphs. And once you've created this knowledge graph, you can then link that with the internet. And the internet becomes one big query engine. And uh, this, for me, is a very, very exciting paradigm that I can talk more about later if you're interested. So um, organizations right now are trying to get all of their data together. And this is called digital transformation. They're trying to get it all in one place so that we can start to extract interesting things from that data. But ultimately, what organizations are really trying to do is create a digital twin of their company. So can I take my physical assets, my infrastructure, my people, and can I create a, a real-time digital representation of my organization so that I can now start to ask questions, I can start to run scenarios. It's like the game Sims, but for your organization. This is where organizations are trying to get to. Um, and in the future, it won't be um, you asking questions and running scenarios. It will be AIs. A AIs will be saying, what if, what if John doesn't have coffee in the morning because he's very often moody in the afternoon? What if we give John tea in the morning and see how he behaves? Uh, it will be AIs that are asking these questions. But ultimately, organizations are trying to create a digital twin. All right, next question. I want, imagine I give you a spreadsheet, a Google Sheet or a spreadsheet, and in the spreadsheet it has three columns. It has a column which is the date, a column which is the temperature on that date, and a column which is the number of ice creams that I sold on that date. So date, temperature, ice cream sales. What do you do with that spreadsheet? What do you do with that information? Ah, you find a correlation. You look for correlation. We can use statistics to try to find a correlation. We might be able to draw a graph. So if we drew a graph, if we had temperature along this axis, and we had number of ice cream sales along this axis, 
What would our graph look like? Yeah, excellent, good, a few people are awake. We'd see some sort of trend going upwards. The warmer it gets, the more ice cream that I sell. This is called descriptive analytics. I'm taking information and I'm trying to find patterns to know things about the world. And I would argue that knowledge is uh, organizing information to help us know things. And, and we can do something really cool now. We can do a thing called predictive analytics, which means put a uh, so if we put a line through it, which you can do in Excel in two clicks, what I have now is predictive power. Yeah, this is called uh, linear regression. And so if tomorrow is 22 degrees outside, I can look at my graph and I can see how many ice creams do I need to manufacture. And I can take this model, I can take this knowledge of the world, and I can put it into a factory. And now I can have the factory manufacturing ice creams based on this knowledge. So this is a picture of, uh, of a linear regression. I might have some data, and I've got my line, and this is my model of the world. And this is what machine learning is trying to do. Machine learning is trying to fit some sort of line to some sort of data. And here's a very simple approach, but we can get a little bit more complicated. We can use a slightly more complicated equation, and now we can have a, a slightly better fit. And we can get a little bit more complicated. We can have a more complicated equation and have a slightly different fit. And all machine learning really is, is trying to fit some sort of line or some sort of plane to some set of dots. And I'll talk more about this later on. OK, so we can take this knowledge of the world, we can put it into a factory, and we can sit back and let the money roll in. That's what we can do. But knowing something is very different to understanding it. Can anybody tell me why we sell more ice creams when it's hot outside? Why do we sell ice creams when it's hot outside? You, huh? OK, cool. I'm inside. It's hot outside. What's the first thing that happens? Huh? You go outside. Good. Well, why do we go outside? Huh? Because we like the weather. We like getting warm. We like the sun. And then what happens? We get hot. And then what happens? We, huh? We buy an ice cream. Oh, fantastic. What do we do with the ice cream? Put it down our pants. What do we do? Huh? You eat it, and why does ice cream, eating an ice cream cool you down? Huh? Thermodynamics. Okay. To expect a computer to understand that narrative, that story from this line, is impossible. You can't see that humans like to go outside, and we like to get warm, and we can cool ourselves down in lots of different ways. This doesn't tell us that. So knowing something is very different to understanding it. Uh, I would argue that understanding is interpreting knowledge, creating a narrative, a story around these patterns to explain the world. Because actually, um, uh, this is where your domain experts sit. Domain experts are really good at understanding patterns, and they work with uh, d um, uh, data scientists to try and find patterns. Uh, but a domain expert would say, this model of the world that we found is wrong. Daniel, this is wrong. Um, and why is it wrong? Because if tomorrow is the hottest day ever, if tomorrow is really, really hot, what will my, manu what will my factory do? My, 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 it's going to produce lots and lots of ice creams. But what will really happen if tomorrow is the hottest day ever? Yeah, exactly, because you, you have to stay at home because you can't reach an ice cream fast enough to cool you down. So our model of the world looks more like this. Yes? And a domain expert would be able to say, it, it's not like this. OK, ultimately, we want to understand the world so that we can make good decisions. In this case, we want to decide how many ice creams to manufacture on that particular day. And so I would argue that wisdom is utilizing that understanding for some objective. And it turns out that humans are terrible at making decisions. And I'm going to try and convince you of that uh, now. So. Um, I don't know if, has, has anybody read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? So I'd highly recommend that you read this book. Daniel Kahneman is a, is a Nobel Prize winning economist. And he wrote a book explaining that we have two brains. We have a fast brain and a slow brain. So one example of your fast brain is what's two multiplied by two? Come on, you're, okay, good. For somebody's, somebody's got a fast brain. Okay, now what is, uh, what's 14 times 763? Okay, that's your slow brain. And uh, there are some things our fast brain is good at and something our slow brain is good at, and it's important for us to understand which is which. If I gave you all a questionnaire, and that questionnaire was to ask whether you enjoyed this talk or not, and I asked you to hold a pen in your mouth like this, and you to hold a pen in your mouth like this, 
when you're filling out the questionnaire, you will more likely fill the questionnaire out more positively than you. And why, why is this? Huh? Why? Yes, yeah, so one is smiling, forcing a smile, and one is forcing a frown. So by changing the shape of the muscles in your face, you will, uh, you will fill out the questionnaire differently. So we think that we are in control of our decision making, but we are bombarded by stimulus. The dream that we had last night and the, the flavor of the coffee and the, the sounds that we hear around us, and all of those things affect our decision making. Imagine these are staff members, these are employees. They could be anything, any type of resource, but imagine that they're employees. And I'm not going to ask you to do this, but um, what we want to do is we want to arrange these employees, we want to line these employees up in a way that satisfy these rules. And imagine we know everything about these employees, we know whether they can fly and swim, we know whether they're male or female. And uh, so, for example, flying uh, uh, staff are not allowed to be, the, uh, sorry, got to be the right of walking staff. And reptiles have got to be at least two away from female uh, felines. And tails like to be near tails, and males like to be near females. Can anybody tell me how many possible combinations there are of these five staff members? So I'm looking at one combination. I can swap two around, I get another combination. How many possible combinations are there? Huh? Nearly? So 120, so 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Do you remember the exclamation mark we learned in school, a factorial? So there's 120 possible combinations, of which uh, many won't satisfy those rules. Some will satisfy the rules, but only one will be the best one. One will be the best combination. Okay, let's make the problem a bit more complicated. I've got 15 staff members. Don't say 15 factorial, but how many possible combinations are there of these? Huh? Yes, don't say a lot. <laughs> it's the right answer, but uh, anybody? Guess? What does your fast brain say? Millions? Millions. Billions. 100,000. Okay, so there's over a trillion possible combinations. You were close. A trillion possible combinations, of which one will be the best one. So one rule to take away with you today, anything more than seven, don't use a human for, okay? <laughs> So, <laughs> that's a really important. So, anything where you have more than seven things, whether you're trying to work out how to spend money on more than seven things or move seven resources, don't use a human for. So, actually, most of industry have problems not of this size, they have problems of this size. So, here I have 500 staff members. Can anybody tell me how many possible combinations there are? No? It's a big number. It's a number that uh, looks like this. And to put this into context, uh, this is how many atoms there are in the universe. Okay? One, of my, uh, one of my clients has 200,000 staff members. And they have 400 people sitting in a room full time trying to solve this problem. Their problem has, is a number that has 9 million digits. This is 1,000 digits. And they have people trying to solve this. Anything more than seven, don't use a human for. Okay, and, but what we can do is we can build algorithms to try and solve these problems quickly and well. These problems are what are called exponential problems. They get very ugly very quickly. Humans can deal with seven or less. Computers can probably deal with about 40 or less. Uh, but beyond that, you need to get very, very clever at solving those problems. And this is the world of optimization. When, uh, when I build systems for companies, when I build AI systems for companies, they usually have these three components. There's a fourth component which is really important, but they usually have these three components. The first component is data. Can we have all of our data in one place so that we can u extract in interesting insights? And there's this myth about data that you need to have all of the data in the world to do something interesting, and it's not true. Let me give you two examples. The first example is this. Uh, a a low-cost airline uh, approached uh, my company a few years ago, and they wanted to know, um, they wanted to predict if people were going to churn, if they were going to leave their website and go and buy from another low-cost airline. And they said, Daniel, we're collecting all, all of their data, we're collecting where they're clicking and where they're looking, we're collecting all of their purchase history, we're collecting, we know the name of their dog, we know what they're going to have for dinner, we're collecting all sorts of uh, information. Can you predict if they're going to go and buy from another airline? And I asked them, why do you buy from another airline? So why, why do you go and buy from another airline? Cost. 
So I said, are you collecting data about your competitor pricing? And they said, no. And I said, well, if you don't give me that data, then I'm not going to be able to find the signal to help solve the problem. You can give me all of the data in the world, but if you don't give me the data that contains a signal, I'm wasting my time. So when I go into organizations and an organization wants to build uh, an AI solution to replace or do uh, the job of a human, I'll go to the human and find out how are they making their decisions? What data are they, are they using? And we use that as the starting point. Let me give you a, se a second example. The second example is um, there's a, uh, it wasn't my example, this is another example, but uh, a short-term loan company uh, where, you, where you borrow a thousand euros and at the end of the month you pay back your thousand euros. A short-term loan company wanted to predict if people were going to default on their loan, if they're going to borrow the money but not give the money back. And they said, we're collecting their LinkedIn data and their Facebook data and their Twitter data, and uh, uh, we can use this to make the prediction. And actually, all of that data was useless. There were, there were two really good predictors. So one predictor was a font, uh, a, a, a typeface that was kept in their internet cache. And that font is often found on gambling websites. So that's one predictor. The second predictor was the number of mistakes that they made when they were filling out the online application form, which was an indication of whether they were drunk or intoxicated. So if you're drunk, you want to borrow more money to get more drunk. Yeah? You don't have to have all of the data in the world. But it's really important for organizations to get all of their data in one place. Because when you do, it means you can start to extract some really interesting insights. And we can use machine learning statistics to try to find patterns in data. That's what these technologies are good at. So we'll talk more about them in more detail later. But these technologies are really good at finding patterns. So if I took a picture of this room, it can tell me who are males and females, who are happy and sad. Uh, and uh, we can now start to find patterns in data way better than any human being. So actually, humans are really good at finding patterns in four dimensions or less. So if I threw a ball to you, this is three dimensions plus time. If I asked you to find data in five dimensions or to find patterns in five dimensions, you're going to struggle. And actually, most problems in industry have uh, dimensions that are hundreds in size. So again, humans are good at finding, pat uh, finding patterns in four dimensions and less. We're good at solving problems in seven and less. Anything beyond that, we're not very good. Uh, but machine learning is really good at finding patterns in hyperdimensional spaces. But once you've found those patterns, one, once we've extracted that knowledge from the, from the data, we then need to make decisions. And decision making is a completely different set of skills to machine learning, to data scientists. And actually, France, Germany, Australia are very strong at this subject. It used to be called operations research. Um, optimization. It's probably going to be called decision science because it sounds sexy. Um, but these skills are often underrepresented in industry. And the true trick to build systems that, um, that drive value in organizations is figuring out how to glue all of these three different technologies together. Okay? Most companies don't have machine learning problems. They have optimization problems. And actually, what this describes is automation. So if I give it data, it goes through some sort of model, and it makes a decision. And if tomorrow I give it the same data, it makes the same decision. If the next day I give it the same data, it makes the same decision. What's the definition of stupidity? Huh? It's doing the same thing over again and expecting a different answer. And most systems in production operate like, like this. And uh, so this is automation. It's not AI. So actually, there are two definitions of AI. One I think is a weak definition, and one I think is a strong definition. The weak definition is getting computers to do things as good or better than humans. And the reason why it's weak is because humans are the most intelligent thing that we know in the universe. We don't know anything more intelligent than us. And when we start to get computers to do things that were tradition in the realm of human beings, we start to assume that that's intelligence. So it's only in the past eight years have machines started to be able to understand natural language, to be able to recognize objects in images better than human beings. And because it used to be only humans that could do that, then now we're calling that AI. And I would argue that benchmarking machine intelligence against human intelligence is not a sensible thing to do, because I really hope to convince you that humans are not intelligent. 
Okay, we are generally intelligent, which I'll talk more about later on, but we're not, in, we're not, we're not very good at sp solving specific problems very well. So the, actually, the stronger definition of AI comes from, okay, so this is, this is automation, and it's doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, the stronger definition of AI comes from uh, the definition of intelligence, which for me is goal-directed adaptive behavior. So goal-directed in the sense we're trying to achieve an objective. We're trying to sell as many ice creams as possible. We're trying to utilize our employees as best as possible. You have to have a goal. Okay, I'm going to take this away now because you're going to get distracted. Uh, uh, be behavior is how quickly can I move towards that goal. If I can achieve that goal faster than my competitor, then I, will arg I would argue that you're going to beat them. But the key word for me in this definition is adaptive. If your system is not adapting itself in production, I would argue that it's not AI. And I haven't seen a single successful system in production that adapts itself yet. So do you remember a few years ago the Microsoft Twitter bot that became sexist and racist very quickly? I don't know if you remember that. Microsoft launched a Twitter bot, and then lots of teenagers started to interact with it and give it lots of bad data, and it started to become very nasty. And uh, this is what happens when you put adaptive systems in production. They can start to adapt in ways that you can't predict. And I haven't yet seen a successful system that has this adaptive component. That's not to say that organizations aren't building it. They are. But building adaptive systems is extremely complicated. It's 10 times more complicated than building just automation. But I would argue those organizations that build systems that can learn in milliseconds as opposed to months, those are the systems, those are the organizations that are going to win. OK? There are actually there are two types of AI. I don't know if anybody can recognize this painting. Does anybody recognize this painting? Huh? Socrates? This is Socrates before he drinks hemlock and kills himself. And Socrates is famous for the Socratic method. And so if I say to you, um, Socrates is a man, and that all men are mortal, what can I infer from that? I can infer that Socrates is mortal. So I can write these rules down, and I can infer new knowledge. And this is what AI was like in the 60s and 70s. And note, it's similar to the semantic web. Socrates is a man. Men are mortal. And, uh, and so this is, this is a, you would create a knowledge graph, and you'd try to extract new knowledge. But it didn't really scale, didn't really work. And in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, a new type of AI came along called neural networks, or sub-symbolic AI. This is a brain of a bumblebee. Bumblebee, one of these things. And uh, bumblebees have a million neurons. Their brain can fit on the end of a needle. Tiny brain. You have 80 billion neurons. Uh, but bumblebees can do amazing things. They see color vision. They navigate 3D worlds. They recognize objects. They solve problems. They communicate with each other. They don't deal with windows very well. But ultimately, they are very smart little creatures. And the question was, could we take the brain of a bumblebee, something smaller than the end of a needle, and could we put that into a helicopter? And now have helicopters being able to navigate 3D worlds and, uh, and solve problems. And so my PhD was trying to model the brain of a bumblebee. And in the early 2000s, this was impossible. A building brains of a million neurons was too complicated. But over the past eight years, We've now started to build brains that are hundreds of millions of neurons. So because of new, new techniques in neural networks, because of cloud computing, faster processing, access to data, we can now build brains that can do things that traditionally only humans could do. Recognize um, a language, be able to recognize objects and images. But I would argue that these technologies are really good at finding patterns in data. But like humans and like animals, they're not very good at making decisions. The really good AI is going to be able to combine these types of technologies with these. These technologies will help us know things about the world. And then these technologies will help us then reason about them and make decisions. And there are very few companies in the world that understand how to bring these two technologies together and then build them in a way that is adaptive. OK, so actually, maybe I can just demystify neural networks. So I don't know if you've heard of the concept of deep learning. 
Uh, so deep learning is now what everybody's talking about and what everybody's calling AI. And all deep learning is, is neural networks, but bigger. Okay? And a neural network is just a mathematical model. It just looks like this. And imagine I create a, a really big one of these that has lots and lots of uh, inputs and lots and lots of layers and one output. And each one of these edges here is just a number, a weight between 0 and 1. So this edge might be 0 0.25, and this edge might be 0 0.3. This one might be 0 0.7. It's just random. I create a random model to start with. And, but it's very big and very, very wide. And what I want to do is I want to teach this, I want to train this to know the difference between an apple and an orange. Okay? What I do is I show it a picture of an apple. So each one of the pixels, uh, each one of these pixels goes into an input, input, input. So I pick, show it a picture of an apple. And these numbers then get multiplied by these random weights, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This adds up all of the inputs. It adds it all up. And then if the input is more than a certain number, again, a random number, so if it's more than 4, this spits out a 1. If it's less than 4, it, spit, it fires 0. And then this 1 gets multiplied by a weight, and it just propagates. So all of these numbers propagate through this model, and the output is random. It will say 0 0.2. Okay. But what I want the, the network to do is say, if I show you an apple, I want you to say 1. And if I show you an orange, I want you to say 0. So I show it an apple, and it says 0 0.2. I said, no, stupid neural network. It's not 0 0.2. Change some of your numbers. Change some of your numbers. So the next time I show you an apple, say, say more one. So I show it another apple, and it says 0 0.3. I say, no, stupid neural network. Change some of your... And then I show it an orange, and it says 0 0.7. I say, no, I want you to say 0. And you keep giving it lots of examples. Lots of oranges and lots of uh, uh, um, apples. And every time it gets it wrong, you punish. And every time it, you get it right, you reward. OK? This is all neural networks are. It's like tra training a child or a dog. And so eventually, what happens is you show it an apple, and it will say 0 0.9. And you show it an, op an orange, and it's a 0 0.1. Fantastic. Excellent. The problem with this is that um, we don't understand inside how it's making its decision. How is it making its decision between an apple and an orange? So it's really important to understand how is a neural network uh, making its decision. We don't know. And it's often misunderstood that humans program AI. We're not programming AI. We, we, we teach it. We train it. We train it with data. And if our data is biased, then the output will be biased. So if I showed you uh, an, an orange apple, some people might say it's an orange. Some people might say it's an apple based on your history based on what you've experienced. And it's the same thing for machine learning. I might show it an orange apple, and maybe it says 0 0.52. Maybe if I gave it some slightly different data, it would say 0 0.48. Yeah? Does this make sense? This is all neural networks are. OK, so, uh, so <laughs> this is where it gets a bit strange. Uh, so I would argue that um, if this is the bounds of human ability, th this, uh, this semicircle or the bounds of what humans can do, I would argue that we can probably take almost any problem, any specific problem that humans solve, and we can probably build an AI that can do it better than us. If we really put our minds to it, we can build an AI that can outperform humans at almost any specific task. Creativity is very difficult, that's more general, but it's inefficient to build 40 different AIs to do 40 different things. It's costly, it's inefficient, and so there's lots of research in building what is called artificial general intelligence. You are all general AI. You are one thing that can do many things. So the question is, can we build one brain that can do 40 things instead of 40 brains that can do one thing? And this is still um, a very hard problem to solve. Very few people are, are doing this. But if you take this to its extreme, if you extrapolate this out, then it's predicted that within our, our lifetime, we may build a brain that is smarter than us in every single possible way. This will be the last invention that humanity will ever create. 
And most scholars predict that it will happen in the next 30, 40 years. And we don't know whether it's, whether it's going to be the most glorious thing that happens to humanity, or we don't know whether it's going to be our biggest existential threat. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to solve this. And uh, we can talk about it later on. And actually, if you, um, if you ask uh, Elon Musk and some other scholars, they will say that this has already happened. The singularity has already happened uh, because there's this concept called the Fermi paradox. The Fermi paradox is this. If you look at the size and the age of the universe, the universe is very big and it's very old. And the likelihood of there being intelligent life in our universe is mathematically very high. There are gazillions and gazillions of habitable planets out there. And the likelihood of intelligent life happening in our universe is very high. The likelihood of that intelligent life reaching a point technologically, like we will soon, to build a superintelligence is also mathematically very high. So if you build an intelligence that can understand space and time and physics infinitely faster and better than human beings, then the paradox is that when we look into the night sky, we should see a uni universe teeming with life. We should see evidence of life, so superintelligence, and we don't. This is the paradox. And the hypothesis is that we are living in a simulation created by a superintelligence in a different universe. Yeah. Maybe we need a drink for this one, I don't know. <laughs> before, we, uh, before we, this is called simulation theory. And I woke up at 2.38 a.m. Uh, because of my jet lag, and I was learning about simulation theory last night. Uh, so, uh, but before we build a superintelligence, we are having to build systems that are making decisions about our everyday lives. And this here is called the trolley problem. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of this. Imagine I'm in my driverless car, and in front of me is a kid, child, and to the right are two adults, and to the left is a cliff. And the car can't stop. Who does the car kill? Adults. What if they're your parents? Still kill the adults. Huh? Who does the car kill? It's difficult, isn't it? I heard maybe one day we will have an ethical setting in our car, where we will say, you want to kill dogs over grandmas and cats over... If you're in India and you have a cow and a dog, which one does the car kill? The dog. If you're in France and you have a cow and a dog, which one does the car kill? Huh? It's still, yeah, there's still a dog. Uh, okay, let me ask you this question. Uh, I, maybe, I actually heard that maybe one day we'll have a brain scan. Your brain, your personality will be put into the car and the car will be behaving based on your per personality. Which is quite interesting. Um, Okay, let me ask you this question. There's a burning building. There's a burning building. The, bu bu the building is on fire. And in the, bu uh, in the building, there's a suitcase with a billion euros. And there's a crying baby. And you can only save one. What, what do you save? Baby. The baby. Of course, the baby. The money. <laughs> Actually, how many babies can you save with a billion euros? Oh, it's oh, a horrible question. Horrible question. But if we build a robot, if we build an AI that decides to go and save the baby, we need to understand how and why it's made its decision. And it's made the decision because it decides that it can save more babies with a billion euros. Okay, uh, so uh, well, there's a very interesting topic called ethical AI or explainable algorithms. Once we build these technologies, can we understand how they're making their decisions? And at some point, GDPR is going to regulate organizations saying that if you are building decisions that are making uh, decisions about people's lives, then you need to explain how it's making that decision. And it's very, very difficult to do that. It's a very, very hard problem to solve. OK, I'll come back to AI in a bit. I want to talk about innovation. OK, so organizations are realizing that they need to be able to adapt quickly to a changing world. Adaptability, for me, is the same as intelligence. And unfortunately, most organizations look like this. So I want you to just read this for a moment. I'm sure you don't have any problems in this company with any of these things. I've heard very, very good things about the Haga culture. This is not a picture of my company. OK, I'm going to take this off now. You're distracted. Uh, <laughs> That, that was a hierarchy, and I believe that hierarchies were once very good at building organizations, but now they are not the best structure to build innovative companies. In fact, I would argue that over the coming 10 years, 
this technology stack that we've talked about is going to be commoditized. It will be available to everybody. We already have access to free compute and lots and lots of data. We already have access to free tools, amazing free tools, to help us find patterns in data. At some point, somebody will commoditize the optimization, and somebody will commoditize the adaptation. The next big battleground for companies isn't technology, it's talent, people. So how do you take people like you and inspire you to innovate? In fact, actually, one of the best definitions of innovation I ever found was this one by Steve Jobs. He said, innovation is creativity that ships. What's the most important word in that def definition? Who thinks creativity? Nobody. Who thinks ships? OK, I think it's the word that. <laughs> All of my questions are trick questions. Uh, that is the process of generating ideas and getting those ideas to a point where somebody's willing to pay for them. And that process is long and hard and painful. And your job as an organization is to shorten that process. The faster you can innovate, the faster you can adapt to a changing world, the more likely you are to win. And what you need to do is motivate your staff, motivate your employees to innovate. One of the best introductory books on motivation I ever found was this one by Dan Pink. He said, um, there are three things that motivate people, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is giving people freedom to do whatever they want. And mastery is giving them the ability to become really good at what they want to do. And purpose is giving them something higher to align themselves with, a, a bigger goal. And actually, Dan would now argue that there are two types of purpose. There's a big P purpose, the big goal, and then a small P purpose, uh, feeling like every day you're making some sort of positive contribution. And when I uh, uh, teach this next generation of students, they don't, they're not now interested in going to work for a bank to make money. They're interested in doing something that has some sort of positive impact on the world. And so I think, for me, organizations that have a strong purpose, they're the ones that are also going to win. So the first challenge you have is how do you attract talent? Uh, and when I work with organizations, I ask them, where are they on this matrix? How sexy is your brand or your industry? And how interesting or challenging are your problems? And if you're not sexy and you don't have interesting problems, you're not going to attract talent. If you're sexy and you've got interesting problems, then you'll attract talent and they will stay with you. And if you're in the other two quadrants, you'll attract talent and they'll leave. They'll leave after a few years. And this can be more dangerous to a company than not being able to attract talent at all. This will help you understand whether you're going to build out your own AI team, work with third-party vendors, buy technologies. It's really important to be honest with yourself. And from what I understand from Hager and your culture and your organization, it feels like you're in this top quadrant, which is good. But once you've attracted talent, then the question is, how do you enable that talent to thrive? How do you create a culture, a set of processes to enable that talent to thrive? And um, we've seen over the past decade a flattening of organizations, the removal of managers, because we, these types of structures are inefficient. They create bureaucracy and politics. Apparently, 70% of people's cognition, their mental energy at work, is navigating corporate politics. I'm sure, again, you don't have that in this company, but uh, lots of companies do. And uh, let me give you an example. Uh, so technologies like blockchain, which we can talk about, will enable this. Uh, actually, let me just, just divert a second and just say something about blockchain. If 20 years ago somebody described to you what the internet was, the internet was a decentralized bunch of computers that shared information. That's kind of boring. It didn't really give you any picture of what the internet was going to do to our lives. And if I say to you, blockchain is a trusted, decentralized ledger, that's also very boring. But I think that blockchain will affect our lives as much as the internet has in 15, 20 years' time. Um, I can't remember who, who said this quote, but we often overestimate the impact of technology on the short term. We think that technology is going to change our lives over the next few years, but we underestimate the impact of technology in the long term. And... Um, so let me try and give you a picture of, uh, of uh, a block blockchain. So if in, if in the future world I'm in my driverless car and my AI knows that I'm late for work, my AI decides and tries to understand the value that, that uh, me being late to work uh, um, uh, has on, on, on me. And what it will do is it will start negotiating with all of the other cars 
in front of you to, to move out of the way. And it will send them micropayments, and those cars, those AIs, will move out of the way based on the decisions that they need to make. This is what the blockchain and AI, this is the type of world that we will live in. Humans have modified our world to make us feel comfortable. We've changed the world around us. And we're now starting to get to the point where we walk into a room, and the room modifies itself around us. So the lights might dim and the music comes on. But eventually, the, the, the world is going to start interacting with itself. With it, machines will be interacting with, it, with machines. And there'll be a Cambrian of explosion of lots of very interesting things that will happen into that, in that world. And block, blockchain will be enabling that world. OK, so uh, my company uses lots of data and various different dashboards to do resourcing. I won't bore you with this. Uh, we can start to, all of this information is available to everybody in the company. So I can know that Alex is spending 20% of his time doing this, and Christina's 20% of her time. And I know that 46% of the time is data science, and 11% of the time is optimization. So all of this information is available to everybody in the company so they can figure out where they should be allocating themselves to projects. If they wanted to, tomorrow, create a pizza shop, a Satalia pizza shop, they could. But we might not have a company in six months' time because we're not good at making pizza. But it's up to my team to decide how and what they want to do. I have complete trust in them. And uh, uh, what's interesting is you can start to get a, a really fine-grained view of how people are allocating their time, how much it's costing the organization, and things like that. One thing I want to say to you is that last year, we had everybody in the company make public recommendations for their salary. So you would all publicly declare, this is what I want to be paid. Okay? And then everybody then voted on whether those salaries should be reduced or increased or kept the same. And we use machine learning to determine how many votes should one person have for another. So based on, uh, based on proximity, based on expertise, so for example, I don't know, uh, uh, this person here will have a much stronger weight to vote on this person's salary than this person because they're further away, even though they're in the same domain. So I had interns voting on my salary, and I had interns voting on other people's salaries who were more highly weighted than me. So the idea is, can we use AI, can we use decentralized decision-making to better um, innovate and drive the, for the, the organization forwards? And one interesting outcome of this was, um, was we had a, a number of females. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. We had a number of females that were making recommendations for their salary, and those recommendations were less than what they should. So they, the females were either undervaluing themselves or they were being really conscientious about the impact of their salary on the company. And I want, you to give, I want to give you one example. So here, this, these are all of the people in the company. And this blue dot here is one of the females. We can see that she had 429 votes to approve her salary. You, your salary is approved. 36 votes to reduce her salary. And 280 votes to increase. So out of everybody in the company, she was the one that everybody was saying, you need to increase your salary. So she would go away, she would come back again with a new salary, and now she has almost 500 votes to approve, no votes to reduce, uh, but still people are saying, you're still undervaluing yourself, you still need to increase your salary. And it, just to point this out, that one was me. So people are saying, Daniel, you need to increase your salary. You're undervaluing yourself. So my salary was set by my organization, not by me. Okay. Um, there's a nice book that I would recommend called The Four. This uh, book is about, um, uh, uh, there's a professor uh, that looked, uh, analyzed these four companies, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, and looked at what made them successful. And he came up with these eight criteria. We've already covered three of them. So one is, are we a Benjamin Button company? Are we, as we're getting bigger, as we're getting older, are we getting faster? Are we getting smarter uh, instead of slower? The second is, are we a talent accelerator? Once we have talent, can we enable that talent to become really good at what they want to do? And the third is, are we geographically located near talent? Can we get access to that talent? So we've covered off these things, and I recommend um, re reading that book. Um, just as an aside, I don't, know, I don't know if it's popular in France or Germany to have a therapist. Uh, I've got a therapist 
I know it's a very American thing to do, but um, one thing that I've been learning about over the past few years is a concept called attachment theory. Now, attachment theory is about how your upbringing as an infant, as before you're two, affects your relationship style as an adult. And I used to think this was nonsense. This is just silly, silly psychology. But having learned about it for the past two years, I've realized that, that those years of your life play a huge part in your relationship style as an ad adult. So if your parents have been very hot and cold with you, you'll develop more likely a uh, anxious or preoccupied attachment theory, uh, attachment disorder, where you don't you don't know what to do to make people love you. What what do I need to do to make people love me? If your parents have been neglected, if you're, if you've been neglected and left alone, you'll more likely um, develop a dismissive or avoidant att attachment style, where you don't believe in love, and when people start to attach to you, you dis you detach. And 60% of the population apparently have attachment disorders. So the majority of this room have atta attachment disorders. And uh, a huge amount of research has been done in how your at attachment style affects loving relationships and how to fix it. How can, how can you sort these, um, these issues out? But very little has been done, very little research, in how attachment styles affect working relationships. And if we go back to that hierarchy, this hierarchy is just a bunch of relationships. And if 60% of those people have disorders, attachment disorders, then of course you're going to have anxieties and bureaucracies and strains. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out how can we make a safe organization, an organization where people feel like they can say things and do things without being bullied or other repercussions. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. So whilst we're using technology to organize ourselves, we're really trying to think from a human perspective, how do we make sure that people are happy and safe? And if we go back to the, the idea of motivation, um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, I would argue that safety and trust is a fourth one that's really important. Okay, uh, so uh, one important thing to, to mention is that all of this data that we're collecting about people is, is very useful. And if you were a, a not, a, a not a nice organization, then you could do interesting things, nefarious things with that data, that, with that knowledge. And I don't know if anybody recognizes this painting. I don't particularly like this painting, but this painting depicts a story by, um, by Plato in uh, the, the book Republic, and uh, it's the myth of Gyges. Gyges is a, um, a shepherd, and uh, Gyges finds a gold ring, and he puts on the gold ring, and he goes invisible. And what does Gyges do with this power of anonymity, with invisibility? This is a clue. That's Gyges. So he kills the king, and he seduces the queen, and he takes control over the kingdom. And philosophers for many, many thousands of years have been discussing what happens and, uh, with humans when they have this power of anonymity. And we can see it on the internet when you have internet trolls. We can see it in our workplace as well, where you have power over other people. And, and I would argue that um, power corrupts. And uh, so uh, for, for me, it's really uh, interesting um, that we can start to use data to as a force for good, we could use data for a force for bad. But for me, by making everything transparent, let me ask you a question, actually. If I could, if I could flick a switch, and if I could delete all of your naughty Tinder data, whatever data you have, all of your naughty data, and then from now on, all data in the world is open. Everything you do is open. What kind of world does that look like? So imagine I'm, I made all of my bank details, my passwords, everything open. What will happen? Huh? What will happen? Anarchy. So maybe people will take money out of my account. Yeah? But I know who's taking money out of my account because it's all data's open and I can take money from their account. Now, one thought experiment I want you to go away and think about is what would happen if genuinely all information was open? Would we live in a better world or a worse world? And I'm not advocating for one or the other, but one thing I'm trying to do in my company is figure out how do we, what data does need to be private and what data doesn't. And so far, almost all of the data that we generate in the company is available to everybody. And what, that, what, what 
uh, what that means is that people feel safe, they um, have honest discussions with each other, and uh, it's actually quite, quite progressive. There's a, there's a concept that's happening in China right now. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's called the... Um, it's called the I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm nearly wrapped up now, so hopefully you've got lots of questions. It's called the Social Citizen Score. I don't know if anybody has seen this uh, episode on Netflix. There's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a, a series on Netflix called Black Mirror, and I'd highly recommend that you watch this, uh, this series. Every episode is different, so you don't have to watch it all at once. And this particular episode is called Nosedive, where every single one of your interactions is recorded and scored. So you would be scoring me right now on this talk. And that score gives you, uh, that, 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 um, uh, notif that, that um, rating gives me a score. And that score I carry around and it unlocks nicer hotel rooms and faster internet. And this is a dystopian view of the world. And actually this is now happening in China. China have adopted a social citizen score where the government is saying, if you do X, Y, and Z, your score will be increased. And we think that it will never happen in the West, but I think it will. It's going to happen inside our organizations, and it's going to happen also and be mandated by our governments. And, I, and I'm worried about this future world. I think that this is a potentially dystopian world where organizations and governments have a control over the population through saying, if you do this, your score increases. And in some respects, we all have a score anyway because our score is our CV and our experience. It's just not very, it's not, it's just very crude. And so, um, uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, so I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about a number of different things, uh, uh, but I'm also very optimistic about the future as well. I don't want to come here and say negative things, I'm optimistic. And it's easy to point fingers to Facebook at the moment, but I want to ask you all, what's Facebook's primary, primary job? Sell ads? And what, why, why sell ads? Yeah. Make, uh, make money? So f Facebook's primary job is actually to make a return for their shareholders. That's what their job is. And they do that by selling ads. And actually, the longer that you look at the screen, the more valuable Facebook becomes. And Facebook have 10,000 PhDs whose job it is to keep you looking at that screen. The irony is that this is being streamed on Facebook. But uh, there are they're, they're 10,000 people whose job it is to keep you and your kids looking at the screen. Because if Facebook can't innovate, then they end up starting to do things that makes those 5% returns, but those 5% returns are coming from them maybe exploiting their users, exploiting the environment, exploiting their employees. And my concern is that this model that we have for the planet, this, this economic model of trying to increase profit, trying to increase GDP, was a tremendous driver for growth over the past two decades. But my concern, two, two centuries, but my concern now is that this is not sustainable for the planet. There are a handful of companies that have managed to win this kind of capitalistic game by attracting talent, making lots of money, and, uh, and, and, and winning. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to actually build a completely decentralized world where you are able to work anywhere you want, you're able to work on whatever you want, however you want, and you're fairly remunerated for that. So in my company, anybody can work on whatever projects they want, and that they, they are paid fairly for that, con uh, that contribution. How could we create a world whereby everybody is um, completely decentralized? In fact, tomorrow I'm flying to Athens to speak at a uh, decentralized uh, event. And I want you to think about what would that world look like, where you can work anywhere you want, however you want, or want on whatever you want. Um, so there's two things that I'm, I'm just going to close now. There's two things that I'm interested in and that I'm trying to solve. The first is called the economic singularity. And there's a lot of hype at the moment around AI and its impact on jobs. This was a survey that was done in 2016 about when do we think AI will take these types of jobs. And this was done in Oxford. So, for example, a surgeon was predicted in, I don't know, 30, 40 years. I don't know, a retail salesperson is 15 years. Uh, transcribe speech in eight years, fold laundry in six years. These were um, experts trying to predict uh, when to, to, to um, uh, AI was going to take their jobs. And actually, um, there's one here which is Go, and Go it was predicted uh, uh, to be solved in 12 years. And actually, we solved that in 2017, one year after. So my concern is that these numbers are over, over uh, um, uh, um, 
predicted. And then the next thing I'm interested in is, uh, is called the technological singularity, which is it's, there's a 50% chance that that will happen in the next 50 years. And I think if we're not cooperating as a species, it will most likely see us as a threat and then get rid of us. And so my, my goal, my purpose, is to figure out how do we create a world where everybody is able to do what they want.